As we go through life, we like to have a sense that we know what we're doing, that we're in control. we figured out the world, how it works, what it has to offer, what we want out of the world. We're pretty clear about who we are and what our abilities are to get what we want and what we have to do. When we're not clear about these things, we suffer. The world doesn't provide us with any a sense of security, any sense of well-being. It doesn't provide food for the mind. Because that confidence we have, that we do know how things work and we, what we want, that's how we feed off the world. So when the Buddha comes and analyzes why we're suffering, he says it's because of we want the wrong things. We have wrong views about the world, a wrong sense of what we should be doing in the world, and a wrong sense about ourselves. And we should let go of these things that we have. We feel that he's leaving us defenseless, starving us. This is he's telling us to, it's okay not to get food off the world. In one way, that is what he's saying, because he says there's something better. But before we get to that better something, he doesn't want to have us starve. He found himself that you, by starving yourself in the path, you don't get anywhere. So he gives us alternative ways to cling. Now he sees the big problem. In these four different ways of clinging that we have, clinging to sensuality, clinging to views, clinging to habits and practices, and clinging to doctrines of the self. Clinging to sensuality, that's the big problem. That's the first thing he's got to wean us off. That's going to be hard. But as for the other types of clinging, views about the world, in other words, your sense of how things work the way things are. Habits and practice clinging, your sense of what has to be done, what should be done, in order to find happiness. And doctrine of the self clinging, who you are in terms of your ability to, to find happiness, and you, the consumer of the happiness. He provides provisional ways of clinging. And of those three, habit and practice clinging is central. He's going to focus on what we do. In the beginning, he uses that to get us over some of our very unskillful ways of relating to sensuality. It's a gradual process, and he calls it a graduated discourse. He starts talking about generosity, the good things that come from being generous. Virtue, the joy that comes from being virtuous, and then the rewards of these things. And the rewards are sensual pleasures, sensual pleasures in the human realm and the heavenly realms. Better pleasures than what we've got. And then when he has us interested, then he points out the drawbacks of even those better pleasures. You can get up to heaven, or the, any of the heavens, and you find that they don't last. And you're just eating up your old merit, and someday you're going to fall. And when you fall from heaven, it hurts. You've gotten used to things being just the way you want them. You think of something, and it appears. You go back to the human realm, or even worse, and you think of things, and they won't appear. You've developed some bad habits. And 
you know, when you're willing to see that the sensual pleasures have these drawbacks. So that's when you're really ready to see that maybe renunciation might be a good thing. In other words, finding a pleasure that's not sensual. He's not saying to starve yourself of pleasure, just to find a better, better one. And this is where he brings in the practice of concentration. And the right forms a right view around the concentration. Now, as I said, habit and practice clinging that he provides you with. This is going to be pivotal. This is going to be the central one that he focuses on. Because in terms of the provisional views that he has you hold on to, views about the world, they have nothing to do with about who founded the world, who created the world, how eternal or infinite or non-eternal or non-infinite the world is. Simply how the world works. How does causality work? In other words, a view of the world that you're going to need in order to be confident that, yes, your actions do make a difference and give you a sense of which actions are skillful within the context of that world. So it's a worldview designed to be focused on action. And the same with views of the self, who you are. His provisional view is simply that you are responsible and you are capable, that you are competent to follow the path and that you will benefit from it. Even when he teaches not-self, he says, let go of what's not-self. It will be to your long-term welfare and happiness. There's still a you in there that you can hold on to provisionally as inspiration, as motivation to act. So you've got a worldview that's focused on action. You've got a self-view that's focused on action. And then the views about action, those are the areas where he goes into a lot of detail about what kinds of actions are skillful in terms of your thoughts, your words, your deeds, how you engage with other people as you go through the day, how you engage with your mind as you sit down to meditate. There's a lot there. His view of the world is a sketch. His view of the self that you use is a sketch. But the nuts and bolts, he goes into a lot of detail, very precise, very accurate, almost diagrams of how things work in the mind. So you can bring the mind to a state of concentration where it can see things more clearly, where it can see its actions more clearly, where it is that it's holding on, where it is that it's creating unnecessary stress and suffering for itself. This is the pivotal clinging. So this is where you focus your attention on what you're doing and trying to do it well. You can think of yourself as being in a cage, like a bird in a cage. And you hold onto the walls of the cage and you're never going to get out. However, one of the walls has a door. You hold on to the door, someday the door opens and you're out. If you hadn't held on to the door, you wouldn't be able to get out. But holding on the door releases you. In the same way, you learn to let go a lot of your old ways of doing things, thinking about yourself, thinking about the world, thinking about what you want out of the world. And you hold on to the teachings on karma. You hold on to the teachings on what's skillful. The Four Noble Truths are a variation or a development of the teaching on karma. What you do that leads to suffering, what you do that leads to the end of suffering. It's all about action. So the Buddha is not leaving you totally adrift, not depriving you of your food. You feed off of right view. Feed off of the confidence that you're doing things that are important, that will have an impact. You look after your intentions, and that will carry you through a lot. You look at your actions, and that will teach you 
where even your intentions may still need some more work. But it's all right here. It's all within your power to do this. This is where you really are in control. Because you do have the power to choose your actions. As John Suat used to like to say, we all have one person, ourselves. So we should be responsible for that one person. We spend too much of our time trying to control things outside, and not enough trying to control our minds. Because that's where the real control comes from, and is effective. So be confident that, yes, your actions will make a difference. And as for your old ways of thinking about yourself, your old ways of thinking about the world, what you want out of the world, learn to get some distance from them. You realize the Buddha is giving you something much better to hold on to. Otherwise, you just hold on to the, the bars of the cage. And you wonder why you're not satisfied. You hold on to the bars that are part of that door, and when the door opens, you're out. And that's the part where the Buddha says, once you're totally free, then there's really nothing you have to hold on to. You don't leave any tracks.